Welcome to the deep dive. Today, we're uh, taking a closer look at Bacillus subtilis. Now, this is a bacterium that I think most of you in medical microbiology will definitely know. Oh yeah, it's a familiar name. But we're aiming to go a bit beyond, you know, the standard textbook stuff here. Exactly. And just so you know, for this deep dive, we've pulled together information using a Gemini deep search. We've also got some images from Microbe Canvas lined up. Right. And if you want to check out all the original sources yourselves, there's a full notebook document available for you to look through. Mm -hmm. So our mission today is pretty clear. Give you, our medical microbiology colleagues, a really solid, comprehensive overview of Bacillus subtilis. Yep. We'll cover its taxonomy, its clinical relevance, which can be a, a bit surprising sometimes, uh, treatment considerations, and those infection control challenges it throws at us. Okay, let's dive in. Maybe start with a quick summary. What's the uh, the big picture with B. subtilis? Well, the really interesting thing is it's sort of dual nature. On one hand, it's, you know, this incredibly well-studied model organism, hugely important in research, and industry uses it a lot, too. Bro, like for enzymes and things. Exactly. But then... Clinically speaking, it's primarily an opportunistic pathogen. It's generally pretty low risk for healthy people. But the spores, I keep hearing about the spores. Ah, yes, the endospores. They're incredibly resilient. And that has major implications, especially in healthcare settings. They just hang around. So tough to get rid of. Very tough. And another key point is treatment. We looked at guidelines from uh, major bodies, both Dutch and international, there aren't really specific guidelines just for B. subtilis. Really? So what do clinicians do then? Well, they have to rely on general principles for gram-positive infections and, crucially, on susceptibility testing for the specific isolate. And it has some built-in resistance too, right? It does, particularly to beta-lactams. That's something to keep in mind right off the bat. Okay, so summing up, well-studied industrial uses but clinically opportunistic. Spores are a big deal for persistence and infection control. No specific treatment guidelines rely on general principles in testing. And watch out for that beta-lactam resistance. That's a great summary. It covers the key challenges. All right, let's get into the nitty-gritty then. How about we start with its classification? Where does it fit in the microbial tree of life? Sure. So Taxonomically, its full lineage is domain bacteria, phylum firmicutes, class bacilli, order bacillus, family bacillaceae, genus bacillus, and species subtilis. Firmicutes, so gram-positive territory. Exactly. And it have common names, too. People sometimes call it hay bacillus or grass bacillus. Because you find it in hay and grass. Pretty much. Reflects its natural habitat. It's everywhere in the environment. Historically, uh, Ferdinand Cohn first described it formally back in 1872. Wow, that's quite a while ago. It is. Though some think Christian Gottfried Ehrenberg might have actually spotted it even earlier, maybe around 1832. And it's significant taxonomy isn't it? Like a reference point. Hugely significant. It's actually the type strain for the whole order bacillus, and it's a defining organism for the Firmicutes phylum. So yeah, fundamental in bacteriology. It's interesting. Like you said before, we know so much about its basic biology, its genetics. Yeah, it's a model organism for a reason. But the specific clinical guidance is, well, lacking. Seems like a bit of a disconnect. It does, doesn't it? The deep biological understanding hasn't fully translated into detailed clinical protocols, probably because it's not a common everyday pathogen causing specific syndromes consistently. So for us in the lab, understanding the basics is key, but then applying it clinically takes some interpretation. Precisely. You need that foundational knowledge to make sense of lab results. But the clinical side often means falling back on broader principles. Okay, let's talk diseases. We've established it's opportunistic, rarely causes trouble in uh, immunocompetent folks. That's the general rule. Its main role in, say, a clinical lab setting is often as an environmental contaminant. You find it everywhere. Makes sense, given its ubiquity in those hardy spores. Exactly. It pops up in pharmaceutical manufacturing, on medical devices, even in cell therapy production. Those spores just get around and survive. So if it is isolated from a clinical sample, say blood culture, from someone who's quite ill. Then you really need to evaluate it carefully, uh, especially if the patient is immunocompromised or has indwelling lines or devices. You can't just automatically write it off as a contaminant in those cases. The clinical context is absolutely 
critical. Are there documented cases where it's definitely caused infection? Yes, there are reports in the literature, but they are relatively rare. And often the reports lack um, specific details about the exact clinical syndromes involved. But treatment was given. Yes. In those reported cases, antibiotic therapy was used. But the lack of detailed case series probably contributes to why we don't have those specific guidelines we talked about. It's kind of funny, though, because you also hear about b cetylis being used beneficially, right? Yeah. As a probiotic. That's the other side of the coin. It's quite paradoxical. Certain strains are indeed marketed and used as probiotics. For what specifically? Primarily for preventing antibiotic-associated diarrhea, there are specific strains like BS50, B2335, CU1, and others mentioned in the sources. And people take these intentionally. Yeah, typical doses might be around 2 to 10 billion CFUs daily for, say, two to eight weeks. But it's important to note the evidence for other health uses beyond preventing AAD is pretty limited right now. So a real Jekyll and Hyde bacterium in some ways. What about subtiazin? I think you mentioned that enzyme earlier. Ah, subtiazin. Yes, B subtiaz produces and secretes this enzyme. Its main relevance isn't really as a direct toxin in an infection context. Okay, so what's the issue with it? The main concern is actually its potential to cause allergic reactions, especially with repeated exposure. It's more of an occupational hazard, you know, for people working in industries that use the enzyme, like detergent manufacturing. Oh, uh, OK. So not a typical virulence factor for infection, but an allergen risk in specific settings. Got it. Let's pivot back to treatment. We know specific guidelines are lacking. What about the Dutch national guidelines, like from swab or RIVM, anything there? We check those. And no, a review confirms there are no specific guidelines for bacillus subtilis infections in the main Dutch national antimicrobial guidance. So they focus elsewhere? Pretty much. They focus on the more common pathogens and general stewardship strategies. It just reinforces that B. subtilis isn't seen as a high priority target for national protocols. So if you're a clinician in the Netherlands facing a possible B. subtilis case. You're relying on general principles for opportunistic gram-positive rods. You'd look at local resistance patterns. And crucially, you'd need in vitro susceptibility results for that specific isolate. Makes sense. What about internationally? Any specific advice from groups like Isamide or IDSA? It's largely the same story internationally. Yeah. Isamide and IDSA also lack specific dedicated guidelines for B. subtilis. Nothing at all. Well, IDSA does discuss general principles for spore forming gram positives other than anthracis, but they don't lay out specific drug regimens for B. subtilis. They generally just nudge towards non beta lactams. Yeah, so the consistent message is general principles and susceptibility testing are paramount. Absolutely. The lab plays a really critical role here, guiding the treatment because the guidelines are so general. So without specific guidelines for B. subtilis, how do we figure out the right antibiotic dose, frequency, or duration if treatment is needed? Yeah, that's tricky. The rare case reports often don't give super detailed info on dosage or how long treatment lasted. They just mention general antibiotic therapy was used. So we have to extrapolate. Pretty much. A common approach is to look at treatments used for severe infections caused by the related Bacillus serious group. They share some characteristics and resistance patterns. Okay, and what's used for B serious typically? Things like vancomycin, gentamicin, linezidolid, levofloxacin, maybe clindamycin. Mm -hmm. The actual dosing and frequency would follow standard guidelines for whatever clinical syndrome you're treating, like sepsis or wound infection. And the duration. Again, guided by general principles, patient's clinical response, the type and severity of infection, not specific B. subtilis rules. So the bottom line for treatment seems to be, start with broad gram-positive coverage, maybe avoiding beta-lactams initially, but then tailor it heavily based on the lab's susceptibility results. Exactly. It's a very tailored approach driven by the specific bug and the patient's situation. Okay. Let's switch gears to some basic lab stuff. Gram stain, nice and easy. Yep. Straightforward. Bacillus subtilis is gram-positive. It'll stain purple. Good. And what does it look like when you grow it on a plate? Culture characteristics. On standard nutrient agar, you typically see medium-sized colonies. They're usually round, opaque, and kind of a whitish or gray-white color. Any variation? Oh, yeah. There can be quite a bit. Colonies might be convex or flatter. The edges can be smooth or irregular, even jagged sometimes. The surface can look smooth or rough, and some strains develop these interesting thick ridges or swirling patterns. Sounds quite distinctive sometimes. What media does it like? It grows well on most general lab media. Nutrient agar, LB agar, TSA, maybe with some serum added, even rabbit blood agar. It's not too fussy. What about selective media? 
It generally doesn't grow on things like Chapman agar, which selects for staph, or McConkie agar for gram negatives. Okay. Temperature. Optimal growth is usually around 30, 35 degrees Celsius. And for sporulation, for those endospores to form properly, it often needs a bit longer incubation, maybe three or four days on specific media that encourage it. Right. These characteristics growing on general media, not on selective enteric media, they really point to its environmental nature, don't they? They absolutely do. Helps differentiate it from typical primary gut pathogens in the lab. And that longer time for sporulation, again, it just highlights how important those spores are for its lifestyle. Let's dive deeper into its identity. Mm. Biochemical characteristics and that intrinsic resistance we mentioned. What are some key biochemical tests for ID? Okay, biochemically. It's typically modal, forms spores, it's catalase positive, VP positive, and it reduces nitrate. It also hydrolyzes quite a few things, gelatin, ascaline, casein, various tweens showing it has various enzymes. What about sugars? It's quite metabolically active. It produces acid from a whole list of sugars, glucose, fructose, mannose, maltose, trethalose, sucrose, xylose, lots of others too, like glycerol, mannitol, starch, very versatile. That broad capability probably helps it survive in lots of different places. Definitely. What about tests that are usually negative? Generally negative for indole, methyl red, MR, and uris. It usually doesn't ferment sugars like adonatol or ramnose, and it lacks certain enzymes like arginine dehydrolase or lecithinase. Are any results variable? Like sometimes positive, sometimes negative. Yes, oxidase can be variable. Yeah. And acid production from some sugars like galactose or lactose can also vary between strains. So you need a whole panel of tests, not just one or two. Exactly. Standard practice for reliable ID. Okay, now let's revisit that intrinsic resistance. What are the underlying mechanisms? How does it resist antibiotics even without prior exposure? Well, it has several baseline strategies. Things like efflux pumps, pumps in the cell membrane that just actively push out antimicrobial compounds. Like little bouncers. Kind of. It also produces enzymes that can modify or break down certain antibiotics. And it has regulatory systems that can actually ramp up the expression of specific resistance genes when it senses stress, like low levels of an antibiotic. Clever. Can you give examples of specific genes involved? Sure. There's the VMLR gene coding an ABC transporter that kicks out lincomycin. TLRB encodes an enzyme that modifies the ribosome, giving resistance to tylosin. Then there's the BMRCD operon that's a multi-drug efflux pump resistant to things like bleomycin. And interestingly, its expression can be turned on by chloramphenicol. So exposure to one drug might induce resistance to another. Potentially, yes. There's also MDR predicted to pump out fluoroquinolones and YTBZE, which seems involved in resistance, but its exact function is still unknown. It sounds like a really complex defense network. You mentioned a stress response, too. The cell envelope stress response. Yes, the CESR system. It involves a key regulator called Sigma-M, or SEM. This system is crucial for resisting antibiotics that mess with the cell wall, like beta-lactams, monomycin, bacitracin. So if you knock out that Sigma factor. The bug becomes much more sensitive to those drugs. And for bacitracin specifically, it has other dedicated defenses too, like the BCAB transporter and the BCRC phosphatase. Plus, the ITPAB operon contributes to high-level resistance. All these mechanisms working together really explain why we see that baseline resistance, especially to beta-lactams in bacillus species. Absolutely. It's inherently quite well defended against certain classes of antibiotics. Critical info for treatment choices. Okay, so knowing all that, how do we actually test a specific B supplement isolate in the lab to see what it's susceptible to? What's the UK's key guidance here? Right. UCAS, the European Committee on Antimicrobial Susceptibility Testing, they provide the standards and breakpoints for interpreting susceptibility tests. You know, the SIR category, susceptible, intermediate, resistant. But we said earlier there are no specific B sub list breakpoints in the UCAS tables. That's correct. If you look them up, you won't find B sub tylus listed with its own set of clinical breakpoints. It reflects its lower frequency as a major pathogen compared to others. So how does a lab interpret the results then without those specific cutoffs? It's a bit more nuanced. They might look at general breakpoints for the bacillus genus if available, but those might not be perfect. Often the lab determines the minimum inhibitory concentration, the MIC value, for each drug tested. The MIC being the lowest concentration needed to stop growth. Exactly. The lab reports these raw MIC values to the clinician, often with a note saying specific B subtalis breakpoints aren't established. Can you quickly recap the general UCAST principle, how MICs normally lead to SI or R? Sure. 
UCAS uses methods like broth microdilution to find the MIC. For bacteria with breakpoints, if the MIC is below the ester breakpoint, the bug is susceptible, treatment likely works. If it's above the R breakpoint, it's resistant, treatment likely fails. Iapause's intermediate success might depend on higher doses or specific sites. Okay. And what about ECOFs, epidemiological cutoff values? How do they help with B subtitles? ECOFs are useful here. They represent the upper MIC limit for the wild type population bacteria without acquired resistance mechanisms. So if a B subtilis isolate has an MIC well above the ECOF for a related species. This suggests it might have picked up some extra resistance. Exactly. It helps distinguish baseline intrinsic resistance from potentially new acquired resistance, which could be more concerning clinically. Even without subcategories, comparing the MIC to ECOFs gives valuable information. So for Bisopolis AST, the process is run the tests using UCAS methods, get the MIC values, and interpret them using general bacillus data, maybe ECOFFs, and definitely communicate closely with the clinician, highlighting the lack of specific breakpoints. That's the practical reality. It requires careful interpretation and good lab clinician communication. All right, last major topic, infection prevention and control. Given those super tough spores, what are the key takeaways for hospitals and labs? Well, again, no guidelines specifically naming B sub to list, but the principles for other spore formers, especially C. diff, are absolutely the ones to follow. The big challenge is the spore's resistance to standard disinfectants. So regular cleaning wipes might not cut it? Often, no. You really need sporicidal agents oh. and robust sterilization for equipment. What are the key measures then? Hand hygiene is critical, and that means thorough washing with soap and water. Alcohol rubs aren't very effective against spores. Good point. PPE. Standard contact precautions. Gloves. Gowns if necessary. Change gloves frequently. Wash hands after removing PPE. Crucial to prevent spreading spores via hands or clothing. And cleaning the environment. Need EPA-approved sporicidal disinfectants things like bleach solutions or specific hydrogen peroxide products. And you must follow the recommended contact times for them to actually kill the spores. Focus on high-touch surfaces and patient areas. What about reusable things like instruments? Sterilization is key. Steam autoclaving or dry heat sterilization, depending on the item. And always, always mechanically clean the item first to remove debris. How do you know sterilization worked? Using biological indicators. These contain highly resistant spores, often Geobacillus sterothermophilus for steam, or even B. satilis itself for dry heat. If the indicator spores are killed, the process was effective. And shared equipment. Dedicate equipment to one patient if you can. If it must be shared, meticulous cleaning and disinfection with a sporicide between patients is essential. Safe sharps handling too, of course. So it really requires a step up from routine disinfection. A significant challenge, especially in places like ORs or pharma manufacturing, where sterility is paramount. Precisely. The persistence of B. satilis spores demands that extra vigilance and the consistent use of these more stringent IPC measures. Okay, so wrapping up our deep dive on Bacillus subtilis. We've seen it's often harmless, even useful, but its spores and opportunistic nature make it important for us medical microbiologists. Definitely. Key takeaways. Opportunistic pathogen, incredibly resilient spores impacting IPC, mm -hmm. lack of specific treatment guidelines, meaning reliance on general principles and susceptibility testing, and the need for sporicidal control measures. Yeah, it's clear that while it might not be the most common cause of infections in healthy people, its unique biology demands a really careful, nuanced approach, particularly around vulnerable patients and in settings needing sterility. Couldn't agree more. So let's end with a thought to ponder. Given how adaptable B. subtilis is with all these intrinsic resistance mechanisms we discussed, what future challenges could it pose? Maybe in hospitals or even in pharmaceutical production? And uh, where should research maybe focus next? Hmm, good questions. Understanding what triggers its switch to pathogenicity, maybe exploring novel ways to tackle the spores, further characterizing resistance. Lots to think about there. Indeed. Remember, everyone, you can find all the sources in the notebook document linked for this deep dive. Feel free to explore further, and please do leave your thoughts or feedback in the comments. Thanks for joining us.